now. There we go. So for our agenda for the next hour or so, um, I will start things off by chatting a bit about Muskoka Conservancy. Um, for those of you who may be new and this is your first webinar, thank you for joining us. Um, then I'll chat a bit about what is tracking, what you should bring with you when um, you're tracking and a bit of background on that. Then we'll talk a bit about Muskoka mammals and look at some specific species and how to identify their tracks in the snow or mud. Then we'll have a super fun bonus that I like to call whose scat is that, um, where we'll take a look at some different types of sign that aren't just tracks, including scat and browse. And then we'll have our period for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know and we'll jump into what Muskoka Conservancy is all about. If I can get to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So Muskoka Conservancy is the land trust of Muskoka, um, and we are a registered charity, and we've been around since 1987. Um, so as a land trust, that means our mission is to conserve um, the nature of Muskoka through land acquisition. So whether that's members of the public and community who are generously donating land to us, or people who are helping us to fundraise or grants that we've applied for and successfully got to purchase lands. Um, We're collecting all sorts of land all over Muskoka um, to protect it in perpetuity for all of our future generations to enjoy. So currently through um, donations and purchases, we are able to protect 51 properties, including our 51st that we just uh, finalized the acquisition for yesterday. So it's very, very exciting. And you guys are probably one of the first to hear about it. Um, so that's super exciting. So now we are protecting nearly 4,000 acres of land, including wetlands, rock barrens, um, waterfront, forests, all sorts of amazing habitats, um, including 60,000 uh, feet of sensitive shoreline on some of our major lakes and some of our smaller lakes as well. And like I said, um, a lot of wetlands as well. So we're sitting at 700 acres of wetland protected, um, which is really important because these areas provide habitat for so many different species, including the fisher whose tracks we're seeing here at um, our Upjohn Nature Reserve in Bracebridge, um, as well as many species of, um, that are at risk as well. So, um, we feel like we're doing a lot of great work protecting a lot of land um, that will be preserved forever. Um, so as a charity, we do rely on donations and our members, as well as an amazing group of volunteers who come out to help us do work on the land, monitor our, our properties and um, help lead special events and all sorts of different things. And we couldn't do it without them. So if you're feeling super inspired after this presentation today, um, you can feel free to send me a message um, or email or give me a call if you're interested in, in volunteering and we can see what we can get you set up with. So that is a little bit about Muskoka Conservancy. And now we'll jump into what is tracking. Um, so tracking is using animal signs, whether it's their prints in the snow, like the deer print pictured here, um, or their scat and droppings. Each individual species will have pretty unique um, different type of scat, which is super fun, um, or even feeding evidence. So whether you're looking at like the brows of bark on a tree or of buds off of a branch, or even a kill site for something like a coyote, you can tell based on that type of feeding evidence um, what species it is. And you know you can learn about the animals and even identify them, which is pretty cool. So that's essentially what tracking is all about. But why do people track? So I know one of the main reasons I like to track is because I go out into the bush and I'm really hoping that I'll see something super cool, an animal I've never seen before. And I may only see a squirrel, or if I'm lucky, I'll see a deer. Um, so instead of you know being disappointed when you're going out and you're not seeing too much, if you take a look around you at the ground and start to identify and measure the different tracks, um, you can learn a whole lot about the forest that way as well. Um, so that ties into all of the points here. Many mammals um, and other animals are really shy and rarely seen. They hear us coming through crack in on the branches and things on the ground um, and they run away or they fly up into a tree and they can't really be seen because generally they have really good camouflage. So you can still learn about them 
um, through their tracks. You can also use tracks to identify species presence, which is really important to us at Muskoka Conservancy because we do take inventories um, of the different species that are present on all of our lands. Um, so we can't always see the species themselves, but if we can identify their tracks, we can learn which animals are using and um, you know, living on our lands. Um, you can also tell the story of an animal based on its tracks, which is pretty cool. You can sort of find out um, based on what its prints look like. Maybe it was, you know, chasing after a prey animal, or maybe it was running away from a predator, um, or maybe it was just trotting along and, you know, walking through the bush. It's also really important for those who hunt and are into wildlife photography as well, um, because paying attention to tracks and signs can lead them to animals that they can, you know, hunt or take photographs of, um, or they can find an area that has really high activity because it's a, a wildlife trail and they can see there's lots of evidence of animals going by and station themselves there um, to get a glimpse of the animals that they're looking to take pictures of or hunt. Um, so those are some of the reasons why people like to track, but mainly just for fun for me anyways. So what should you bring with you when you are tracking? You should bring a retractable tape measure um, for measuring the different prints and their sizes, a notebook and pencil. It's best to bring a pencil instead of a pen because if you're out in the winter, the pen ink may actually freeze. Um, and you can use those to write down the measurements of the tracks and trails that you're seeing a camera to photograph and document those um, those tracks, as well as a tracking field book or guide. So the one that's pictured here is Tracking and the Art of Seeing, How to Read Animal Tracks and Sign by Paul Resendez. And this is the book that I use to gather all of the um, measurements that you'll see in the presentation today. So it is one that I definitely recommend if you're looking to get a field guide for tracking. And these days you don't really need a notebook and pencil and a camera because it's all on your phone anyway. So that is an option too, if that's what you wanna go for. So here is our uh, next slide. And this is probably the most overwhelming one because this one outlines all of the different things that you should measure and consider when you're tracking, which looks, looks like a lot, but don't worry. Um, so you'll want to take a look at three main things, the paw prints, of course, their trails, as well as you'll want to consider their gait and speed, but we won't focus too much on that today. So when looking at the paw prints, you can actually count the number of toe, palm, and heel pads that an animal has um, to figure out what species it is, um, but we won't pay too much attention to that today because oftentimes, um, by the time you see the prints, it can be a little hard to identify all of the different toes um, and palm pads, um, but it is definitely something to consider. You'll also want to take a look for the presence of claws or fur. So some species will have retractable claws, um, which means that when they're walking along, they actually won't register in their print. Um, so members of the cat family, of course, have retractable claws and you won't be able to see them. Um, you'll also want to look for fur because a lot of northern species that spend a lot of time um, up in the snow need fur to keep their, their feet warm when they're walking through that cold, um, cold conditions. So that's another thing to look for. You'll also want to consider the shape, whether an animal has a really round footprint or whether it's really narrow. And for our sizes, you'll want to measure the length and width. So as you can see here, uh, if you guys can see my cursor, you'll measure the length from the tip of the nail print, if the print has it, all the way down to the base of the palm or heel pad. And if they don't have nail prints present, you'll measure it to the tip of the toes. For the width, you'll measure at the widest part of the print. Um, Another thing you'll want to consider is the register of the print. So there's generally two different types of register, a direct register and an indirect register. So a direct register means that the rear or hind print is falling exactly directly into where the front print was. So the prints will always directly overlap and that's a direct register. And generally animals that are 
um, thin and have a slender body will have a direct register because they walk more narrowly because all of their feet are, are under them. <laughs> um, for indirect register, um, there will either be a little bit of an overlap as pictured here, or they could be completely side by side um, and not have any overlap at all. And this will generally be for um, wider bodied, larger bodied animals that tend to do more of a waddle like a raccoon or a bear um, or something like that. So they don't have their feet always right under each other. And that is pretty much it for the paw prints. And so now we'll take a look at the trails and what you should consider for that. So of course, you'll wanna measure the length and width of the trails and strides. So to measure the stride length, you'll measure from toe to toe as pictured here between their sets of prints. And that's one stride length. For the trail width, similar to the width of the prints, you'll measure from the widest part of the trail. This also ties into the pattern, um, which can change depending on gait and speed. So as you can imagine, um, if an animal is just trotting or walking along in the bush, it'll be different than if they are galloping or running after a prey um, species. So it can change, but for today, since I don't wanna overwhelm you guys too much, we'll be looking simply at um, just like a simple trotting or walking pace and not um, all the different types of bounds or gallops. So hopefully you guys aren't too overwhelmed with all of the things that you have to, to measure and consider because there is one really important first step that can, um, can help with all of this and really narrow things down. And what that is, is to narrow down what animal family you are looking at first. So for example, all members of the cat family will have si similar characteristic and all members of the weasel family will have similar characteristics. Um, so if you can take a look at those characteristics and narrow it down to the family, then you can take the specific measurements to figure out what exact species it is. So it really makes it a lot easier than just, you know, going in blind and trying to figure out everything all at once. Um, so over the next couple slides, we will take a look at the different families, and then we'll look specifically at some species. So this is where I'm going to ask for some participation, and I'll ask you guys some questions, because what I will put on the screen, I'll show you guys here, is I've got the scientific family name. So for our first one, it's Canidae. And then I have all of the shared characteristic that members of the Canidae family will have. And then I will get you guys to shout out what, um, what family you think that is or what species you think might belong to that family. So for Canidae, these species have narrow prints, a direct register and narrow trail width, which generally means that they're quite slender, narrow bodied and their hind tracks will always be smaller than their front tracks. So what family do you think the Canada family is, everyone? I'll open up the chat. I see there's one here. Cat family. OK, someone said cat family. Any other guesses? Canada sounds like canine. The cat family is very close, but Emily's got it here. Dogs, fox, Fox. Yeah. exactly. So it is the, the dog family or the canine family. So let me get my picture up here, hopefully. There we go, okay. So yeah, so this is the red fox. So generally in Muskoka, we have three different species that belong to the dog family, including the red fox pictured here, the eastern coyote, as well as the eastern wolf. The fox and coyote tend to be a bit more common, so we'll look specifically at those guys today and what their measurements are. So you'll notice as well on all of these um, slides with the specific species that I have um, some pictures of a ruler um, with a highlighted portion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the highlighted portion is actually the longest their print will generally be. And so I've got these set up here to help you visualize the differences between the different species and hopefully it helps you guys out. 
So um, these guys are both members of the Canidae family, so their prints are quite similar, but they do have some differences. The main one being that the red fox's prints and trails will always be smaller than those of the coyote, but there can be a bit of overlap if you're looking at a really small coyote or a really big <clears throat> fox. But some of the other things to consider for the red fox, they are a bit of a more northern species. So they are one of those species that actually have very furry feet, um, which makes their pads barely visible. Um, so if you get a really good print, you can actually see um, the hair and fur in their print. They also have a bar at the base of the heel pad. So if you take a look at the examples here, you can see it's quite flat along the base of their heel pad compared to the Eastern Coyote, which has this divot in. Oh. So that's another difference. In terms of the sizes, um, feel free to take a picture if you want to remember these. Um, their paw prints will be one and three quarters to two and seven eighths of an inch long and one and five eighths to two and one eighths wide. So fairly small. Their stride length will be 14 to 21 inches, and they have a very narrow trail width of only two to eight and a half inches. For our coyotes here, they tend to have a bit more oval prints, so a little bit more round than a narrow fox print, um, but still pretty similar. Their print sizes will be two and seven eighths to three and a half inches long, by one and seven eighths to two and a half inches wide. Their stride length, of course, will be um, longer as well, um, 20 and a half to 30 inches with a trail width of two and a half to 13 and a quarter inches. And so those are the, the main differences between the coyote and the fox. And we'll move on to our next family. Just gonna see if we've got any questions. I can share the slide deck with you guys if you'd like at the end. We have all your emails so I can send them to you guys. So this is our next family, the Felidae family. They all have round prints, retractable claws that are not visible in their prints. So you guys might remember what I said about that earlier. Um, and they have a quite narrow trail width as well. So. I'll open the chat to see if we have any guesses or feel free to shout out as well. Carol says cat family. What do you guys think? Do you think it's a cat family? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I you guys got it. it. So it is our cat yeah, family, Felidae or yeah. Feline. You might hit chat, um, but then we might open our screen too. So I know yeah, I, I hear some I background do. noise if you guys want to mute please no worries um let's get our picture up here it's a little fussy sometimes there we go oh thanks he's a beauty yeah so Rip this I is one of the family. <laughs> if you it's guys wouldn't mind muting we've got some feedback <laughs> in the background maybe i can try and mute <laughs> There we go. That should be better. Sorry, guys. Let me minimize things. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so yeah, this is our Canada Lynx. Um, we have three members of the cat family in Canada, two of which are generally found in Muskoka. And there are the two, of course, that we'll look at today. So we've got the Canada lynx on the left and our bobcat on the right. The other member of the family is the puma, cougar, mountain lion, whatever you want to call it. We generally shouldn't have them in Muskoka unless it's a released pet, um, but there have been historic populations in Ontario, but they aren't here anymore. Um, these species um, pictured here are quite similar. The main difference is that the bobcat is much smaller in size. Um, and the Canada lynx is a much more northern species compared to the bobcat, which is a southern species. Um, however, their ranges do overlap um, in some areas, including in Muskoka. So there is a chance that we might get both of them here and you might see both of their prints. Um, 
So that's why we'll take a look at the differences today. So for our Canada lynx, um, as I mentioned, they're a more northern species. So they have um, very furry undersides of the paws, which you'll see in their prints and is why um, the examples we have up here, you can really see that the prints are obscured and much less defined than those of the bobcat on the right. Their paw prints um, and trails will be much larger as well. So their paw prints are three and a quarter to three and three quarters long and three to three and three eighths wide. So pretty symmetrical and round as well. Their stride length will be between 15 and 31 inches long with a trail width of five to nine and a half um, inches. So pretty narrow, but still a little bit wide because they have such big paws which act like snowshoes in the snow. For the bobcat, you'll see it's much smaller. So their paw prints are one and five eighths to two and a half inches long and one and a half to two and five eighths wide. The stride length will be shorter between 11 and a quarter to 25 inches um, and a trail width of three inches to five and three eighths. So these are our two cat species. And we'll move on to the next ones. So I think this might be the most difficult family uh, for you guys to guess because it's got a really interesting name, Mustelidae. Um, and the shared characteristics of this family are that they have small and furry prints. Um, generally, they will have a bounding pattern also referred to as a tutu, which means um, both their prints are side by side. So they move um, their front feet together and their hind feet together compared to the other two families we just looked at, which will alternate their feet. Um, they also have a narrow trail width, meaning they're quite slender bodied. So I think I see a message in the chat. Emily said beaver, Martin weasel. Any other guesses, anyone? Fisher. Fisher, mouse. Okay, lots of, lots of good guesses. This is the weasel family. So the weasel family includes many, many species, um, including the Martin and the Fisher, which were both mentioned. Um, but they also include, let me get my picture up here. My goodness. There we go. The ermine, which is pictured here, um, as well as short and long-tailed weasels, um, the American mink, skunk, and otter are all a part of this family as well. Um, there tends to be a lot of overlap in the species that are similar in size, like the marten and the mink and um, the ermine and those smaller weasels. So today, We'll specifically be looking at the American mink, which is pictured here. So as mentioned, they have small free paws, which can be hard to identify and measure. But if you do get a good look at their prints in the snow or mud, um, they will be one and a quarter to two inches long and one and a quarter to one and three quarters wide. So again, really symmetrical, really round prints. The American mink compared to other members of the weasel family will have more consistent distance um, in their strides. So they'll always be generally the same length compared to other members which might have a, you know, um, a stride length that's 11 and then the next one is 25. Um, but the mink will stick to generally the same distance which will be between 11 and 38 inches. And again, they have a fairly narrow trail width because of their long slender bodies. Um, so it is generally between two and four inches uh, wide. And you can see that bounding pattern up here as well. So that is our Mustelidae family. I think we might have a, okay. Um, so next is our Ungulata family, which might sound weird and you might think it's going to be a really difficult one to guess but once I explain their characteristics it should be pretty clear to you guys uh, because these are our hooved animals so they have four um, toes or hooves two are crescent shaped that we generally will see in their prints and they do have two dew claws as well which will occasionally register in their prints. They may have direct or indirect register, so that's not something to always rely on, but they are pretty easy to identify. Um, and they have a narrow trail width as well. So can anyone tell me what the Ungulata family is? 
So someone said, I'm noticing these slides do not have the animal name on them. Can this be added before you distribute? Yes, I can add that in to make that a little uh, a bit more clear for you guys. So yes, Carol said deer family for our ungulata or ungulates. So yeah, this is our deer family. Hopefully I can get the picture up here. There we go. So this is our white-tailed deer. And the other member of our family, of course, is the moose. Um, so their prints are extremely similar, but the main difference is gonna be their size. Where the white-tailed deer is between 100 and 300 pounds, the moose is, uh, can reach up to 1,400 pounds. So there's quite a big difference in their size, which of course you're able to see in their prints as well. So for our white-tailed deer, um, their prints will be one and a quarter to three and a half inches long by one and three eighths to two and seven eighths wide. Their stride length um, will be between 14 and 34 inches long with a trail width of three and a half to 11 and a half. Um, so they can have quite a narrow trail width as well. For our moose, of course, they're gonna be a lot larger. So they are between four um, and six and seven eighths inches long. Um, so quite a bit so longer than those of the deer and three and a half to five and three quarters wide. Their stride length will be much longer, of course, as well. So generally between 30 and 54 inches with a trail width of eight and a half to 16 inches. So pretty narrow again for being such a, a small or sorry, such a, a large animal, not a small animal for sure. So those were our ungulates. So this one I think will be the easiest, the Rodentia family. Um, but as you can see, I haven't listed shared characteristics because there are actually many species that are a member of this family, which have quite variable um, prints. So they don't have too many shared characteristics, but I think you guys should be able to guess which family this is based on its name. Does anyone have any guesses? Let me check the chat. Yes, you guys got it. Mice, beavers, which are rodents, of course. You guys got it. Rodentia. Let me get my picture up. There we go. So this is the North American porcupine, of course, which is my favorite member of the rodent family. Um, but the family also includes members like squirrels, mice, beavers, muskrat, Tons of different species, which don't have a lot of overlap, um, as you guys can imagine. So today, specifically, we'll take a look at everyone's favorite rodent, the eastern gray squirrel. I have a few living in my roof right now. Um, and my actual genuine favorite, as mentioned, the porcupine. Um, so you'll notice for the eastern gray squirrel that I don't have the ruler up because they have really tiny prints which are really hard to measure. So I won't put you guys through that um, because generally you won't be measuring them and you'll use, use other characteristics to identify them, such as um, their bounding um, pattern. So if you take a look, the two smaller prints are their front feet, which will always appear parallel side by side to each other. And their hind feet will be ahead of their front feet, um, which of course are larger. So they've got this bounding pattern, which is quite unique to them, although it is similar to the rabbit family as well, which we will look at in the next couple slides. Um, their stride length can be quite variable depending on how far they're bounding. So it can be just six inches or it can get all the way up to 30 inches. The trail width can be anywhere between three and a half to five and a half inches wide. Um, I've also put some details for their toes um, and their, their palm pads, but I won't get into that today. Um, for our North American porcupine, they have really unique um, and interesting feet because their um, heel and palm pads are actually merged together to create one big pad. And they have a pebbled appearance and texture to them um, because like this guy here up in a tree, they need some good grip for climbing up the trunks of trees. They also have long nails. So generally you'll see a gap between um, the prints of their nails and their toe, their toe pad prints. Um, and you can see 
them up here in our example as well. In terms of the size of their prints, um, they will be two and a quarter to three and seven eighths long by one and a quarter to two inches wide, so not too big, um, with a stride length that is generally between six inches and ten and a half inches, and a trail width that is five inches to nine inches. So quite wide um, because they are a larger bodied animal, which also gives them an indirect register. So their prints will always be side by side because they have more of a waddling gait. They will also have a tail drag present, um, which is the first species that we've looked at today, which has a tail drag. Um, so generally you'll see their prints and then there will be what looks like a sort of smooth slide in the middle um, because they're pulling their tail behind them as well. So these are our two rodents that we're looking at today. So that was actually the last one that I was gonna get you guys to guess. And now we'll take a look at three um, species which have smaller families. So the Procyonidae family is the family that the raccoon belongs to. And the raccoon is actually the only member of this family that is found in North America. All of the rest are generally tropical species, which you won't find around here, of course. Um, so for that reason, the raccoon is pretty unique. We also have the Leporidae family, which is the rabbit family. Uh, pictured here is our snowshoe hare, which we'll look specifically at. There is also the eastern cottontail and jackrabbit, um, but they tend to be less common in Muskoka. And I mean, snowshoe hare is the most picturesque, so we'll look at them today. And of course, our Ursidae family as well, which is the bear family, um, which our black bear belongs to. We, of course, also have the grizzly bear and polar bear in Canada, um, both of which you will not find in Muskoka. <laughs> so looking specifically at these guys, um, for our snowshoe hare, um, as you can see in their prints, they are similar to the squirrel prints because their hind feet are ahead of their front feet. Um, the main difference is though that their front feet are always going to be one ahead of the other compared to the squirrel, which always have them side by side. So that's the main way you can tell the difference between them. Um, their front feet, um, for all of these species that we're looking at on this slide, their front feet are smaller than their hind feet. Um, so their front print can be up to two inches long and can reach um, over one and a quarter inches wide for the snowshoe hare. Their hind print can be up to four and three quarter inches long and is generally between one and a half to four and a half inches wide for the snowshoe hare. Um, as you can see, there's quite variability between the, the rulers on this sheet. Um, so for our raccoon, they have really unique prints, um, which are almost human-like with their long finger-like toes, um, which do have nails as well, which will register occasionally. Uh, for this uh, species, their prints will appear um, side by side. The front and rear will be beside each other, like pictured here. Again, because they are a wider bodied animal, they won't have that direct register at all. For their size, the front paws are two to three inches long um, and two to two and a half inches wide, with the hind paws being larger, of course, two and three eighths to three and three quarter inches long by two and a half wide. So that is our raccoon. For the black bear, you can see they've got they've got pretty long, long feet. They're almost maxing out the ruler that I've got on the screen here. Um, but in terms of their toes, they do have five toes, which will register with long nails um, and big palm and heel pads, as you can see in our example. The front paws will be five to six and a quarter inches long and three and three quarters to five and a half inches wide. And their hind paws will be six to seven and three quarter inches long by three and a half to five and a half wide. I do have the stride length and trail width for these guys as well. So it is generally between um, 17 and 23 inches long for the stride length and nine and a half to 14 and a half for the trail width. So pretty large <laughs> compared to some of the other species that we looked at. Okay, 
So now we're on to our bonus. So whose scat is that? Plus other brows and other sign. So I will show some pictures of um, of sign that belongs to a specific species, and then you guys can let me know what animal you think created that uh, sign. So here we've got some scat and another interesting type of uh, sign. Does anyone have any guesses? <clears throat> Moose. Moose, okay. Any other guesses? Deer. I hear moose and deer, so, um, and we've got one in the chat. Let me check that. Doug says moose. So it is hard to tell from this one because I don't have something to, um, you know, give you an idea of what the size actually is, but this is white-tailed deer. But of course, moose and deer prints, they're part of, or uh, scat, they're part of the same um, family, so it will look very similar, um, and it's hard to tell without something to tell you what size it actually is. So this is white-tailed deer. There we go. Um, so deer and moose will both have uh, round pellets. Um, deer can be maybe the size of one of your smaller fingernails, and moose would be up to like the size of your thumbnail um, for size. And then the picture that we have on the right is not of feeding evidence, but it's actually an antler rub. So when um, deer and moose get their antlers, they grow a velvet, um, which is like almost like a fuzz um, on their, their antlers, which they will eventually lose. And when it starts to fall off after they've fully grown out for the season, it can get really itchy and irritating for them. So they'll rub their antlers on trees and other things and create this type of sign uh, pictured here. So that is actually an antler rub from a deer. But good guesses, everyone, thank you. Our next image here is of brows on a tree, on a tree's bark. Does anyone have any ideas what animal created this sign? What do you guys think? Beaver. Beaver. Good guess. Very similar to this species, but it's hard to tell again. I'm not providing you guys with the best pictures, am I? But this is pretty high up off the ground, so farther than a beaver could reach. We got two people saying porcupine, so that is correct. Um, but it is quite similar to that of the beaver as well. So, um, porcupine will eat buds and leaves, but they'll also eat the bark off of trees as well. And this is what it will look like. So if you see um, bark that's been chewed off, you can you can pretty much see the, the teeth marks in here as well. And it's high up um, in a tree. It'll generally be a porcupine that's having a delicious snack of, of brows. There we go. Here is our next photo here. You guys can see that it's got some, some hair and fur in there, which implies that this is a member of um, the carnivore family. So it could be cat or it could be the dog family, but I'll let you guys guess. Coy oh, oh my gosh, you guys are so good. I got three coyotes in the chat. You guys are correct. Let me get it to pop up, there we go. So generally members of the cat and dog family or any member of a family that is a carnivorous family, um, you'll see evidence of fur and hair. Sometimes you'll see pieces of bone and cartilage as well, um, which lets you know definitely that it's a member of, um, well, that it is a canine or excuse me, a carnivore. There we go. Um, so good job guessing there. And see, this one's got a penny for size reference. So that's much handier. <laughs> Our last picture we've got here is a, um, an individual that is an omnivore, because as you can see in the right photo, we have evidence of berries and fruit that's being eaten. And then in the left picture, um, it's more meat and hair and things like that. Okay, we got some guesses, bear. Yeah, you guys got it. So this is Black bear scat, um, they are um, an omnivore. Um, so depending on the time of year and what their main food source is, you'll see um, either berries or apple waste in their feces, or you'll see more hard 
hard feces representative of the uh, fur and meat that they've been eating. So you guys are experts, I think, now. If I can just get my PowerPoint to cooperate with me. There you go, black bear. Okay, so that was our last slide for, for whose scat is that? So now if you guys have any questions at all, um, please let me know. You can put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, I've included my contact information here as well. So if you are um, interested, you know, in volunteering or if you ever have any, uh, any questions at all regarding anything nature related, you can feel free to give me a shout. You guys don't have any questions. You guys are experts after my webinar. I feel, feel like I've done a good job then. If there aren't any questions, I'll thank you guys so much for joining me today in our tracking uh, webinar. Oh, I see something in the chat. Oh, thank you from Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you um, so much. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned something new. And as I said, feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions about tracking or prints that you've seen outside. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I got one question here. The difference between wolf and coyote tracks. Good question. I had a feeling I might get that question. Um, and similar to the difference between coyote and fox prints, the main difference is the size. Um, so wolf prints will always be larger than coyote tracks. And if you're interested in the measurements, I do have my book. And if you send me an email, um, I can send you what the measurements are for the wolf tracks if you are interested. Or you can Google it as well, because it's probably online too. Thank you for your question, Marg. I'll hang around for another minute in case anyone else has questions that come up. But if you guys are good, feel free to to head on out of the webinar. And thank you guys again. Fisher Prize name Bracer. Pardon? They talked about the Fisher Prize they saw down here at the Bracer Resource Center. Yeah. Yeah. So are you ready to leave? Any koi wolves in Muskoka? There likely are. I think at this point, um, you can expect that pretty much anywhere around here that there will be a bit of overlap and hybridization. I think it takes genetic testing to know for sure. Um, but I know during a monitoring event that we had last, um, last field season, we did have a member of our group who um, who did believe that they saw a koi wolf out on one of our, our potential properties. So it, there's a good chance that there are some koi wolves in Muskoka. Thank you, Maggie. <clears throat> Amanda, does the fox mm -hmm. track usually walk single file? Um, do you mean like if there's multiple foxes or just one fox when it's walking? Just one fox when it's walking across the field. I've seen them where they track almost in a straight line where like a dog oh. sets its tracks. Yeah, good question. I don't know I if think, you've noticed that. Yeah, for a lot of members of the wild dog family, they will tend to walk more of a straight line. So even coyotes and wolves will do that as well as the red fox. Whereas I think... Uh, Domestic dogs, you know, they're a little far away from their ancestors now, so they get a little bit more sporadic and will walk around in different and like not in a straight line. So definitely for for wild dogs, they tend to walk more in a straight line than domestic. Good question. I guess they say coyote is the breeding season right now to watch your animals. Yeah, I think so. So they might get a bit more protective. I'll type it into the chat here, Peter. It is Paul Resendez. I believe it's spelled like this. 
<clears throat> I can check my slide here. I have it open. Yep, that is the correct spelling there. Oh, apparently I typed it privately. So let me get that open to everyone. Paul Resendez. There we go. That is the author of the field guide that I use. Okay, I think that might be it for all of our questions. But like I said, if any come up tomorrow or next week, feel free to give me a shout and I can get back to you as soon as I can to answer any questions. And thank you everyone who's still in the chat um, and call for joining. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for your time too. Have a thank good day. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye.